Thank you, everybody, for joining us in this Catholic Truth podcast, where we teach and preach nothing but the Catholic truth, which has come down to us for 2,000 years from Jesus and the apostles. We are happy to teach and preach the truth from Jesus, and we want to help you to know your faith, love your faith, defend your faith, and to live it with purpose and passion. And we want to thank you for joining us today on this episode. My name is Brian Mercier. I am your host, and we have a very special guest today. His name is Paul Fig pen. And he is an internationally known speaker. He is a best-selling author who's an award-winning journalist who's written over 35 books. And I believe they've been translated into something like 15 different languages. So <laughs> he's really studied and he's really popular. And uh, his most famous book is The Rapture Trap, uh, which you can find on his website and on other uh platforms as well. And we'll be talking a lot about that in this video, which we're going to be talking about the rapture. Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to say that uh, Mr. Thigpen in 2008 was appointed by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops as to their National Advisory Board as a lay uh, advisor. And he serves the church as a professor, a historian, an apologist, and a catechist. You might say that he does it all. And he's been in apologetics for a very long time. And there's no person that I can think of on the topic of the rapture than Paul Thigpen, who is an expert on this. And the rapture is, as we're going to see on biblical, it is not a teaching of Jesus Christ, and it's not a teaching of Christianity. And here to talk about this today, we are going to welcome to the show, Paul Thigpen. Thank you for joining us today. Great to be here, Brian. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. And uh, some of our uh, listeners might be asking, well, uh, what's a rapture? <laughs> you know, for any of our listeners who might not know or think they know, you know, could you just give us a brief explanation of what the rapture is and uh, maybe a little bit of the controversy around it? Sure. Yeah, it's uh, it comes from a Latin word that means to be snatched, like snatched up. Uh, that's why raptors, velociraptors, the dinosaurs are called <laughs> that. They were snatchers. And um so it's in, in Catholic tradition, it has more to do with being caught up in ecstasy. So you might talk about St. Catherine of Siena praying and being in a rapture, that kind of thing. Um, there's some, uh, some Christian traditions, though, in which it is a, a notion, even though it, the word itself in that sense doesn't appear in Scripture, uh, the notion that in between Jesus' first coming, which was, of course, at Bethlehem as our Savior, and his final second coming in glory, clouds of glory, and with his angels and saints, um, that second coming as judge, that there is in between, toward the end of time, uh, a secret coming in which uh, he will be invisible, he will be uh, unseen, unheard by the world, but that true believers will be snatched, you might say, or pulled out of the world uh, into heaven, go back to, with him to heaven. And, uh, that's, and that will happen. Uh, they disagree over exactly when it'll happen. Some say before the Great Tribulation at the end of the world, some say in the middle, some say after. So basically you have this kind of end times thing where God's going to take his faithful followers from the earth <clears throat> and then all hell at some point will break loose upon the people who are left. Is that fair to say? Yes, although again, there's some disagreement. Some folks would say they're all snatched out before any of the tribulation at the end. Others would say in the midway. Others would say more toward the end. But the idea is that, that he comes secretly Jesus comes secretly and kind of rescues the church out of what, what's happening to the rest of the world. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I think it's fair to say that many many people on our channel will say Catholics are evil because they don't believe in the rapture. You know, it's clearly biblical, but Catholics, you know, you don't follow the Bible. But it's not just Catholics that don't accept the rapture, is it? I mean, as far as I know, Orthodox don't accept it. And if I'm not mistaken, most Protestant religions uh, would reject the rapture as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that's one of the things I've, I've found. I grew up in a tradition where the rapture was talked about. I'm a convert to the Catholic faith. When I started working on my doctorate in church history and historical theology, it was you know, inevitable that I, I look at this notion in light of, uh, in light of history. And one of the things I discovered was that it really is not a Catholic Protestant argument. Um, not only is it not part of the teaching of the Catholic Church, as you said, the Eastern Orthodox churches don't, but also even the, the founders of, of the Protestant movement, uh, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and then later people like Wesley, who, who founded the Methodist uh, denomination or movement anyway, um, none of them believe that. They would interpret the passages that are often seen as biblical proof and never mention such a thing. It's a very recent development in church history. 
the first time. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, please. I was the just going to ask you about that. When, okay, if it's not biblical, if it's not historical, and most Christians didn't accept it, and even Protestant reformers, long after the Protestant Reformation didn't accept it, then you know, kind of, when did it begin? Who invented it, and how did it come to light? It's a very complicated kind of history. You have the ideas you normally meet it today, say in certain fundamentalist Protestant circles. Um, full blown did not really come out until the 1800s. Before okay. that, you might have an occasional person, like in the late 1700s, um, you had, uh, interestingly enough, a Jesuit uh, from Chile who taught uh, taught a kind of rapture, but it was, um, interestingly enough, it was based on the people who were rapture were the ones who were daily communicants with the Eucharist. <laughs> so uh. obviously that's not going to be picked up. <laughs> um and you'd have an occasional person, Cotton Mather, one of the Puritan divines, that there was some kind of taking the Christians out of the world, but very kind of eccentric, very unusual. Um, what happened in the 1800s is that it became uh, a popular belief among a small circle of a certain kind of Protestants in England. Um, and they themselves were partly influenced by um, a young woman who, who uh, had what she thought was a vision of things. And the way she described it was this kind of rapture. It became very popular in those circles. And then what happened is it, it influenced certain movements in England, Christian movements in England. And at about that time, the American revival movement was uh, one of the waves of revival was getting into uh, and, you know, becoming very popular. And so you ended up having hundreds of thousands of people going to revivals in America from a particular kind of revivalist tradition. And the Bible teachers that kind of crossed the Atlantic. Uh, and a lot of the people who believe this notion in the rapture started preaching it to these large <clears throat> uh, revival meetings. And that began to spread it. Um, and then places like Moody Bible Institute, uh, named after um, Dwight Moody, who was one, one of the great kind of evangelists of the uh, revival movements. Um, they picked it up and began training pastors for all over the country to believe it. What, uh, what really pushed it, though, was that um, there was a particular commentary of the Bible, the King James Bible, that taught, made this a part of a whole system called dispensationalism. It would take a long time to go into it. But anyway, in his uh, notes, it, uh, he just put it as if it were a fact. And a lot of folks would read the Bible, and they here's, you know, sometimes it's this much text and, and this much commentary, and they would read it almost as if it's part of the Bible, and, oh, well, this must be how it is. And um, that particular Bible called the Schofield Bible after the man who, who did it, who, by the way, was not a theologian. He was actually a lawyer. Um, go figure. <laughs> anyway, It's a good so, keynote to understand. Yeah, yeah. The Schofield Bible then became the best-selling Bible in, in America. And tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of copies sold. And people were reading these notes as if it were just part of Scripture. And so between the Schofield Bible and the revival meetings and then certain places like um, Moody, Bible college where they were training pastors who then went on to train, you know, to teach their people that it became extremely popular in America. And, uh, and it went to some other places in the world too, but America was kind of the anomaly, uh, both in history and geographically. Um, we know so many people here, I do personally, you know, who believe it. Um, and so it kind of seems like part of the norm, but if you look at the whole span, 2000 years of church history and the entire church, you know, there are more than a billion Christians worldwide who do not believe this. Um, so it's good, good to have it in context that way. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like you said, in the 1700s is virtually unheard of. In the 1800s, it started to get traction. And uh, <clears throat> there was something about the Left Behind series too, right? Like that, would you say the Left Behind series, that fictional book series, kind of really helped popularize this unbiblical uh, theory of the rapture? It did for a new generation. It's it's the kind of idea that goes through cycles, like a lot of things, you know, like this, you know, almost religious fads, but this is one with some staying power. But what will happen, especially with the kind of guy, folks you have on TV, the TV preachers who will push it, for some it's a, it's a whole industry, I could go into that, oh my goodness, where they, they push this and get people to believe it, and then they sell their books and their videos, and, and that's kind of their industry. But um, what happened was uh, there probably had been a, Back in the uh, 70s, there was a big push. I mean, and Hal Lindsey wrote a book uh, about the, called the Great Bl Late Great Planet Earth. Yep. And that became so, so many millions of copies, bestseller, that that became, and that was the time when I was graduating from high school, um, just becoming a Christian. Uh, 
that so that became one way in which it got popularized. But here we are, 30 years later, around the turn of this last century, around the year 2000, uh, a new generation, and it gets popularized, yeah, by um, a couple of authors who uh, wrote the Left Behind series, have been part of their teaching all along. And this Left Behind books, there were novels that built on the premise that Jesus did come back secretly. And they ended up making a feature film out of it, which was really popular. Um, and then they did all kinds of stuff, children's books, and you know, I could go on and on, but <laughs> it became quite a quite an industry. And it was at that time um, <clears throat> when more than ever it began to kind of um, what do I want to say, the leak into uh, uh, Catholic circles. Um, Catholics were watching the TV stuff and they're watching the films, reading the books. Um, and of course, again, it's, it's not Catholic teaching. So what happened was right around that time you had the, for instance, the, the bishops of Illinois got together and made a statement saying that um, this is not Catholic teaching. We understand that this, these books have been uh, given as a sign reading in Catholic schools and they're in Catholic school libraries. They're not to be there. <laughs> and uh, yeah. one particular TV preacher, I won't, uh, name him, uh, you know, but was telling his, was trying to woo Catholics to his audience. And, um, and he said, Oh, the Catholic church teaches us that kind of thing. And the, you know, Pope embraces this. And, um, and then, so I had, uh, Matt Pinto, the founder of Ascension mm -hmm. uh, press yep. approached me and said, you know, there's no Catholic book responding to all this. Why don't you do it? And, uh, that had been one of my specializations in my church history study. So I said, go for it. Wrote the Rapture Tribe came out in I think 2001, and it's still in print, yep. which is unusual for for Catholic paperback. Yep. Um, so it it was like the first book. Then right after uh, Carl Olson, one of my friends, and some other folks began to also write about it. So it wasn't just my book, but others that began to kind of say, "Hey, you know, let's look at this in historical and theological context. It really is not biblical. It's really kind of eccentric historically." And um, so I, I mean, even had that same TV preacher get on in one of his episodes and claimed that with my book and claimed that I didn't believe in the second coming because I didn't believe in the rapture. <laughs> it got really messy. I, I approached him privately, tried to, and said, let's get together and talk this out as brothers. That's not true. Stonewall, but um, that's neither here nor there. Uh, anyway, there, there were some people so deeply invested in it that uh, they could not even consider the possibility that the rapture is not true. Now we're going to get to the Bible verses that Pro some Protestants try to use in a, in a minute. Uh, you know, they utilize three or four verses to try to prove that there was a rapture. Um, but before we do, um, why don't Catholics and most Protestants accept it? I mean, maybe this is a rhetorical, easy question, but why don't they accept the rapture? What are some of the problems with the rapture? Well, it's, uh, you know, first of all, traditions imported to us and, um, we don't think that some notion like this is going to be God's going to buy some kind of private revelation to a young girl in a vision, uh, put out this doctrine that is contrary to what the church has always taught and the way the scripture has always been believed, not just by Catholics, by Orthodox and, and Protestants. Um, that it really does, when you go to look at the verses that are used to support it in scripture, they don't support it. Um, they've always been interpreted other ways, not just by Catholics, but by the others I mentioned. Um, and in fact, it it ends up uh, pressing against certain things that we know to be Christian truth, um, and that it when it has been popular, it's it's often led to spiritual and social uh, consequences that are that are bad fruit. Mm -hmm. I guess is the best way to put it. So, kind of for all those reasons, but the main reason is that um, this is not the faith that was received from, from the apostles and has been handed down. It's uh, it's a very eccentric, late in history development that comes in part from, you know, some young woman's vision and ecstasy and, uh, and then others too kind of picked up on that. So basically it's a, a tradition of man uh, to quote Mark 7, 7, or in this case, a tradition of woman, <laughs> but it doesn't come from Jesus. Yeah. And I mean, you could also say, all right, you had that idea kind of in the Jesuit from Chile, but, but again, it wasn't really yeah. similar, but the interesting combination, the interesting connection I feel to make is that that Jesuit's work on what he thought was, he never, I don't think he ever called it a rapture, but this withdrawal of Christians who are faithful communicants, um, daily communicants, that book was translated by a man in England who then became a promoter of the rapture doctrine. 
So you have to wonder if he was influenced by this Jesuit thing. And by the way, the church condemned the book that the Jesuit <laughs> had written. Of course. Um, but uh, but things like this tend to have, so it's not just the girl in the, the vision, but so this guy picking up this thing from a kind of renegade Jesuit in Chile and, um, and then trying to look in scripture to find some place where they could say, oh yeah, that's what that's talking about. That's how ideas like that often uh, often get going. Yeah, and you you mentioned scripture, and I just mentioned it a minute ago. Um, could you mention or talk about perhaps some of the top verses that some uh, denominations and non-denominational churches will use to try to prove uh, the rapture, and maybe talk about why they don't hold up? You know, why Christians throughout most of history did never did not translate them that way, and it's a very new invention. Yeah. There are a couple of places in First and Second Thessalonians where um, St. Paul is talking about the Lord's second coming. So First Thessalonians 4, 17, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 1, 7. And um, he talks about the Lord's returning and, um, and that we'll be caught up in the air to, to meet him. So they'll say, OK, see, that's it doesn't say rapture, but that's what it is. We're being caught up out of the world and taken out. Uh, of course, the problem is that when he describes those, all the words he's using with the angel shout, the, the angel trumpet and the shouts and stuff are all the same things that he uses throughout to mean the final coming. And uh, and so this is not talking about something separate. Some This is talking about some kind of event when Jesus finally comes in glory at the end, not secretly. It's anything but secret with like the lightning coming from east to west, as Jesus said. And Right. And uh, the sound of the, the sound of the trumpets of the angels and, and all that. He's coming with his angels and saints. There's nothing secret uh, about <laughs> that. Um, and in fact, you know, so, I mean, that leaves you with the problem. All right. So what does it mean that we're kind of caught up to meet him? And uh, when he appears, here's the interesting thing that, and you can find this, St. John Chrysostom in the fourth century is already talking about this in this passage. During that time and during the time of Jesus, um, there was something that was called the perusia. And meaning in Greek, an appearance, an appearing. Uh, it was a popular custom in the Mediterranean world where uh, if you had either someone who was royalty or a, conquer a general who had just had a great conquest, uh, that they would be welcomed into a big wall city uh, with a parade, kind of like to honor them. And as they came into the city, and it was called a Perugia, an appearance, the people of the city would go out to meet them and then escort them back in. And uh, apontesis is what was called the meeting going out to meet them. And Perugia was the name of the appearance they would make. Those are the words being used by St. Paul there. And um, if you think about it, the gospel, the story of, of uh, Palm Sunday is precisely that. Jesus is seen as a king who's coming into the city. So the people go out to meet him and they, you know, put down their, their garments and their, have their palm branches and all the other things. And then they escort him back in. They gave the people a chance to kind of... Um, you know, take take part in the party, have have fun in the parade, yeah. and uh, and in fact, Saint Paul then uses this uh, in other places the imagery of how uh, how Jesus took captivity captive and he made uh, a spectacle of all the demonic powers and then gave gifts to men. That's from the same thing because what the conquering generals would do in this parade is that they would bring the leaders of the of the enemy they had just conquered in, and then they would take the loot from the enemy and give it to the people as a way of you know. Mm -hmm brown nosing <laughs> and getting their support and, and divide up and give them gifts. That's exactly what he's talking about. So it's a very common thing there. And as early as the fourth century, St. John Chrysostom is saying, yeah, that's what this is talking about. Jesus Perugia, he's like this great king that St. Paul has alluded to coming in uh, to earth at the end. And those who love him and want to receive him, they come out to greet him. Now, as you said, and nothing secret the, about it, right? Right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that's, oh, go ahead. I Sorry, was gonna say, gonna, but, yeah, I was going to uh, comment on that secret part because it almost mm -hmm. seems like Jesus came, but then he's going to come again secretly. And then he's going to come again at the end of time. So it's not the second coming that traditional Christianity understands. It almost seems like it's a third coming. Exactly. And that's been, you know, the critique all along, you know, from, from folks who don't, I mean, even Protestant scholars who look at this, who reject the notion of a rapture say, look, there's no way you can talk about these as, because the, the argument would be back, okay, well, it's not really two more comings, it's two phases of the second coming. But even, <laughs> you know, Protestant scholars just say, no, you really can't get that from, from the text. It is it is a third coming. He comes and goes back. 
I think it's like a phase, you know, phase one of another when he has another coming. But, but yeah, they you know, just say, no, I've heard of something like that. That's that's a new idea. So that's one one set of passages. Another one that you'll hear the most uh, frequently, I think, and and this is where the words left behind come from. For, they gave the, its title to the series, the books, uh, and the movies, is that um, in the gospel, Matthew 24, 37, and following verses, uh, Jesus is he's in the middle of what's called the little apocalypse in the gospel. Uh, his his apostles come to him and say. Um, they're talking about the stones of the temple, and he says it's going to be torn down one day. And so they say, well, when will that happen, number one? And number two, and what will be the sign of your coming? Apparently, they believed, and that I think it was pretty common then, that when the tearing down of the temple would come and all that, that that would be the time when he appears, and he does that. Right. Um, but when he responds, it begins to be clear he's talking about two different events. And we know from history, you know, 70 AD, Jerusalem gets torn down. That's the judgment of the people. That's when he says, when you see the troops surrounding the city, get out, and all that happens. Yeah. Um, but that answers the first question, when will be the time that this happens? When you see the city being surrounded by troops, that's the day of judgment, get out. But then he goes on to talk about things at the very end when he returns. So he's answering the second question, but you can't confuse you know, those two things. Um, so that's the passage, the context of it. But what they focus on is where Jesus says um, that uh, at the time of, of the judgment, that there'll be, for instance, two women in the fields, and one will be taken and the other one left behind. Two people sleeping in a bed, one will be taken and the other left behind, and all these things. And so by confusing those two things, they say, oh, see, that means that the secret rapture, they're going to be snatched out of the bed, snatched out of the field, snatched from the mill or wherever it is that they are. And the righteous one will be taken away and the, the evil one left for judgment. So, first of all, I would say, and I think, you know, it's a great tradition of the church, not just Catholic, is that, no, it's, that's, that's, that's talking about um, judgment coming on suddenly, that there will be people who die and people who survive when Ju mm -hmm. Jerusalem is, is destroyed. But even if it were the final judgment let's just grant that um the key here is that jesus says it will be as it was in the days of noah mm. one will be taken and one will be left behind okay in the days of noah who was taken away in judgment that's what he's talking about it's taken away in judgment not snatched into the air in the days of noah who was taken away the wicked were taken away they were washed away by the flood they were drowned they were lost and the ones left behind were the righteous, Noah and his family. So if Jesus says this is this kind of judgment is about those like the days of Noah, they've got it exactly opposite. It's not that the righteous will be taken away and the evil, the, the wicked left behind. It's the wicked who will be taken away in judgment hmm. and the righteous left behind. And we would agree with that. Yes, that's what happens at the judgment. Finally, when he says to the, you know, to the goats go to the place you know for you go go to hell they say yeah. but you're going off to judgment they are taken away to judgment then but that's the very interesting forever mm -hmm. that's very interesting because the bible doesn't say it just says one will be taken and one will be left it doesn't say you know good or evil they just assume it's good people um perhaps based off the erroneous passage uh, interpretations of thessalonians but I, it definitely distinctly compares it and says it's going to be the same as the days of Noah. And as you just said, that's the evil people were the ones who were taken and the righteous were left. And they do it completely backwards. I think that's so interesting. And take it away, not be, being snatched out of the air. Nobody got snatched <laughs> out of the air, you know, into heaven in, in Noah's day. But who did get taken away? They were taken away in judgment, washed away by the by the flood, by the judgment of God. Yeah. Um, very powerful, very frightening, <laughs> you know, kind yeah. of thing to keep in mind. That's uh, that's that's what will happen at his second coming. The, the wicked will be judged and taken away to eternal misery. So interesting that for basically over 1800 years, virtually every Christian in existence ever always associated these verses with the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then a couple mm -hmm. individuals who will just say one of the women, for example, who have no biblical training and maybe some others as well, just completely change that, somehow start to preach that, and it slowly starts to like a trickle effect, catch on. And um, 
And that, and that's why we're doing this show, you know, because many people are sincere. They sincerely believe this is biblical. They sincerely think this is going to happen. And they really just don't know uh, that it's not. And they don't know the difference because they've never been told. And so we kind of want to reverse that message for anyone who's confused by it and help them to see what the true Christian tradition is. Yeah, that's, you know, and that's one reason why I've worked <laughs> worked my, my head off to get uh, a PhD in historical theology because in church history, that's it's so useful. Um, you just have the book sitting in front of you. It's the great book. It's it's the book of books. But when you go to interpret it, you need you need help. People mm -hmm. take that. They can take it in a thousand directions. And one of the first places to look is how has the church, Christians in general even, interpreted this over all the centuries? And you begin to see, oh, this notion is eccentric. It's late. Nobody even thought of that <laughs> uh, until you know, until relatively recent. Now, for some folks, if it's been around 200 years, well, that's forever. But I, I remember talking to a guy one time who very, I mean, without even realizing the irony of what he was saying, uh, he said, well, what are you studying? And, I'm, and he was, he was uh, an evangelical Christian. He said, what are you studying? I said, well, right now I'm studying the church fathers. He said, oh, yeah, I like those guys like Moody, like I mentioned a while ago and stuff. And he named all these 18th century, I mean, 1800s <laughs> revivalists as church fathers. And I thought... Okay, we need some more church history here. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not I'm not trying to dismiss it or judge them. I mean, our culture in general has has given up so much history and so much study. And one thing I learned: my mom had Alzheimer's, and one of the things I learned for an individual that's also true of a, of a, a society and a culture is that if you lose your memory, you lose your identity. Mm. That's so important. The memory is critical to identity mm. because the time came when she for much of her past that she could not remember who she was. Yeah. And I feel like our culture in that place in many ways. Of, I've taught college students who would come in and they have no sense of history at all. History from the last two years. I would hear the people, people, the people in the parish from the earth. You know, who said that? And they would kind of guess uh, George Washington. And then now they guess Washington afterward. They said, during what way? Uh, during World War I, <laughs> they had no idea yeah. who said it. And they even had no idea that, that Lincoln was not with World War I or that Washington wasn't with the Civil War. Or I thought, oh, my goodness. So we've got to learn. We've got to kind of help people to learn their history. And I would even add on to and that. It's and it's amazing say, the context it gives you. Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely would add on to that. No disrespect intended, but for Protestant religions as well. They've used to be part of the Church of Christ before Luther broke away. And, you know, for a long time, they remembered that history. But subsequently, they've just forgotten that history, in a sense, forgot who they are and forgot what the true, uh, real truth of Christ is. And I, I think that's interesting. And many Protestants even disagree on this. And maybe this is the last thing that we can talk about today. But, <clears throat> you know, this kind of has a lot to do with the end of the world, the second coming of Christ. Uh, some people say that, you know, Jesus is going to come back and just take his people with him. Others say that Jesus is going to come back down and literally live here on earth for a thousand years. Some will say he will literally put his feet on Israel and rule from there. And, um, you know, there's different people who have a futurist view, a preterist view, and different things like that. Can you talk about, you know, uh, uh, maybe briefly, just kind of give people a nutshell version of these different views, and then uh, maybe what the Catholic view is and why it's correct? Yeah, let me see if I can, how I can summarize. There's, you that's know, a lot. I, I, I apologize. Lot. Yeah. <laughs> you, have, um, you have a notion that's referred to as millenarianism uh, from the Latin word for thousand years. There's a passage in Revelation, that book that is you know, so figurative in its language and so mysterious in so many ways, that talks about um, that that Christ will will reign for a thousand years and then the devil release afterward. Um, that he'll be bound for a thousand years with Christ reigning and then he'll be released afterward and then the end. Um, so you do have a couple of early Christian writers who see that as, as a, a kind of a literal thing. And a little thousand years. But early on, the church said, no, that's not what that means. Uh, we're not sure what it means, but it doesn't mean that. St. Augustine's position has probably been the most kind of the mainstream position that that Jesus, the, the book is talking about the thousand years, like all the most of, you know, all the numbers in the book of Revelation, 144,066. They're all symbolic. This, uh, If not, I mean, we're in trouble because it talks about 144,000 
being saved and going to heaven. Well, then right. what about the rest of us, you know? <laughs> and uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses take that literally and then say the rest of us live in an earthly paradise instead of heaven. But That's right. um, so that thousand, uh, you know, he, he says it's 10 times 10 times 10. It's the number kind of, of, of great fullness um, and, and a long time, whatever it means literally. But so St. Augustine said, yes, the devil is decisively defeated by Christ. And then the church age comes where to a certain extent the devil is chained and that that thousand years refers to the life of the church not a not a a literal thousand years but a very long time and then at the end when it is time for christ to return soon and the great tribulation that the devil is no longer bound i mean it's not that he can't do anything now but the stuff he was doing before the church came was much worse um that he'll be released and God will give him the chance to do all kinds of terrible things in the earth, the great tribulation. And then Christ will come. So that's called a millennial, which means no millennium, but that's, I'd rather call it um, kind of a symbolic millennium um, that the thousand years refers to that. So you have others who believe that the millennium and people like uh, Calvin was one of these, John Calvin, the Protestant reformer, that the thousand years refers to a time when, um, that that we will have a time on earth of things getting better and better and the Holy Spirit ruling more through his people. Yeah. And then at the end of it, we'll basically have a perfected world that Jesus comes back and we give it to him. So the premillennial folks think all this horrible stuff is going to happen before Jesus comes and reigns for a little thousand years. The postmillennial guys say, no, actually through the work of the Holy Spirit, there will be a gradual improvement until things are really good. And then Jesus comes back and we kind of give it to him as a gift. Um, and uh, the Catholics would say, no, it's more like a, you know, present millennial would be the word that most often used. We're in the millennium now. We're in the thousand years. The church is here. Christ is reigning through the church. Um, and, but there will be a time at the end when it gets really bad. So you've got those interpretations. Um, the Catholic Church has specifically now, it's it's a part of church documents, magisterial documents, um, and you have it also in um, the catechism, that the millenarian view is mistaken, that there will not be a literal rule of Christ for a thousand years here, in which everything is just beautiful and perfect and, you know, all that. Um, that no, it, that uh, he, we don't know for sure when he's coming back. It could be at any time. But when he does come back, then in all this glory um, that he will come back as judge and he will judge the world. Uh, all the passages about the final judgment will be there. There will be a resurrection of the dead. So everyone gets their bodies back um, because the body will take part in the judgment as well. Uh, the, uh, there'll be the judgment, the resurrection of the body, the, um, the, the righteous then those who are in friendship with God will be welcomed into heaven. Uh, if they're not already there, you know, the saints and the saints do come back with them and the angels uh, at the second coming. And then the others sent off to hell and then all that happening. Then uh, the devil and all of his allies and all the evil will finally be definitively prevented from doing what they've done. And that there will be a new heavens, a new earth. We're not exactly sure what that means, but that um, this heavenly condition then for all of us who are in friendship with the Lord will be done and, and, and no, don't have to worry about all the other stuff anymore. Decisively done, decisively ended all that evil. Um, Great. Um, that's a good summary. Thank you. Uh, and I think <clears throat> I find it interesting personally that throughout the whole Bible, I mean, I, don't, I can't think of a single instance where most Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, or anyone else translates the number 1000 as a literal number. I mean, I'm pretty sure like almost every scholar knows that it's a symbolic number, which means a long period of time. You know, one day to us is like a thousand days to God, exactly. a thousand days yeah. to us is like a day to God. And it's like, but yet recently some people have said, nope, this thousand years is literal out of a complete break with all of Christian tradition, not just Catholic, but all Christian tradition. And they say that that's literal. I find that very interesting. Again, you do have a few people in church history uh, who have said literal thousand year reign, that kind of thing. But it's, I mean, it's it's so minuscule, the number of people that up until recently that it was, you know, everyone would look at it as, as, as eccentric. Um, <laughs> so the, you know, the, the great theologians of the church, go back to the church fathers, the ones, um, they, they would all say 
Yeah. It's symbolic. Yeah. Okay. So basically all of this comes down to is the rapture is not a secret coming. There's nobody going to be snatched into the air at any time. The movies left behind are not true. The books are not true. And we're, what we're really talking about here is the end of time where Jesus is going to come again to judge the living and the dead. And um, it's not going to happen before that time, right? Yes. And, and the important thing to remember, again, this other notion of the rapture can lead people to kind of like give up on trying to do anything good in the world. Well, it's all going to hell literally anyway, so why <laughs> should I? Um, there, so it's, it's very important to realize if we don't see, see, you know, accept that rapture notion that we're in here for the long haul. And also that Jesus said, those who endure to the end will be saved, not those who are snatched out will be saved. So suffering is a part of the Christian life. And that's one of the things I discovered becoming Catholic is this beautiful teaching about redemptive suffering. Suffering can have a redemptive purpose. Whereas the whole rapture notion is I'm going to escape that suffering because I'm the good guy. So I get pulled out or, or at least I've been saved. So I get pulled out, but that's not, that's not the Christian life. I've talked to a, a, Ch a Chinese Christian who's been imprisoned in, in, in labor camps and stuff all their life under the communist party there. And if you were to come and say, Oh, don't you know when Jesus comes, he's going to come secretly and to keep us from suffering he's going to snatch us out so that we do it and they would say well, why didn't he snatch me <laughs> you know You're right they they know better than that that all through history christians suffer and, and if they take it the right way it's redemptive but they are persecuted we're not going to be snatched out when things get really bad that's exactly right matthew chapter 10 you know pick up your cross and follow me he who does not pick up his cross and follow me has no fellowship with me you know it cannot be my disciple and so i think that's a very uh crucial point that we we are going to suffer and you know what you made the the perfect uh connection that we're talking about matthew 24 where one will be saved uh, left and one will be taken but jesus also <laughs> makes it clear that he who perseveres to the end will be saved meaning you're going to yeah. have to persevere yeah. through the suffering to be saved exactly um exactly. perfect i mean i think that's a great summary of the rapture i mean you wrote an entire book and i want to point my audience and i'm going to link uh your information your website and everything you do uh mr thigpen down to down below in the description section and we're going to let people know uh, where they can follow you we're going to link your book down there and i would highly recommend people that you get this book if this Rick, I mean, look at how thick this book is. We just scratched the surface. If you would like to know a lot more information on the history of it, on the Bible aspect of it, just the different religions and how it came to be. I mean, there's a whole part on William Miller in here is a very interesting story. I mean, he's self-taught and yet so many people followed him and it's just so interesting. So uh, I'm going to link all this down below uh, for our audience, and I would uh, recommend that you all check that out. And uh, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Thigpen, for joining us today on Catholic Truth and explaining this to us in our audience. Brian, it's been a great pleasure, and I, I pray that God will, will uh, bless all your, your viewers and uh, lead them more and more to the truth about him and conform them to the image of his son. Amen. And the pleasure is all ours. And uh, we just want to thank everybody for tuning into our podcast today. And thank you for tuning into Catholic Truth, your place so that anyone at any moment, anywhere can come to know exactly what the Catholic Church teaches and why. Please check out our show notes below, everybody. Check out our Facebook, follow us on Instagram or podcast. And if you would consider supporting our ministry. You are the reason we exist, save souls and change lives. So check that all out below. Thank you all. Please pray for us. We are always praying for you. God bless you.